Rangadi, where I came face to face with the Lord for real. And uh, it happened with a dream. There was all these people from Bangor Elam trying to get me to go to Bangor Elam. And I was going, go away. No, I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to know you. I don't want to know who your God is. I'm happy with what I'm doing. But when I really wasn't happy with what I was doing, you know, I was hiding behind a closed door. I was in a dark room, four floors up. And every time I took a smoke or something out the skylight window, I was looking at a church. And the church had the cross right there, full view, big cross. <laughs> so I was always like, ah, there you are, God, you know. I suppose you're, you're sitting there just looking at me and I'm having this, this sort of life. I was kind of very negative towards who God was, but I did acknowledge him. I was always giving off going, I, I, don't, I hate you. <laughs> I don't like, you know, everything about the world and all that kind of stuff. So I was always throwing abuse at God day in, day out. And um, so one night, I ran out of everything. I ran out of alcohol and I ran out of, uh, of hash and stuff like that. And I was, uh, I just went to sleep. In the, in the sleep, I had a dream. And the dream was where I, I died. I started throwing up, and I started throwing up glass, and I started throwing up cigarettes, I started throwing up ashtrays, came up through my throat, and it tried to fit out through my mouth. I don't know how all that was possible, but it was all happening inside this dream. And I ended up dying in my own vomit. And I felt, like I felt myself die, I felt the blood leave. I felt like I'm, I'm in the vomit. And that's what, yeah, I, I, I felt like I woke up, but I didn't wake up actually. I was still in the dream. But when I woke up, I, my face was pressed against the desert floor. And that desert floor, I could feel it on my face. Uh, when I got up off the desert floor, I could see dead bodies all over the ground. And I saw this triangular shape of locusts come across the top of my head and go up and over a hill and disappear into the distance. Now, I woke up from that for real now. I woke up, I was sweating. I thought I was going crazy. This dream was just way too, way too heavy. So, I wake up. I feel the need to sit by a telephone. Back then, we didn't have mobile phones, so we had wired-in phones. I feel so old. But, uh, yes, wired-in phone, where you get tangled in the phone while you're trying to have a, a, con a conversation. But I sat by the phone, and I didn't know what was going on. But what was happening on the other side of town was that my friend Kyle McCartan had got up, felt, I need to give Rodney a call. But I don't have his phone number. So he went and he found my dad, who was working on this banger stand. He's a taxi driver. And he got the phone number, went back to his house, and called me while I was sitting by that phone. He said, would you like to come to Bangor Elam again? <laughs> he says, we're meeting Jim. Do you know who Jim is? I didn't know who Jim was. But it turned out Jim was J-I-M. It's Jesus in me. And they'd had this outreach. So I ended up going to that outreach. I watched this guy called Stephen Legg hang upside down off a crane and detach himself. He was escaping from a straitjacket. And he threw that straitjacket down. It was when I saw the straitjacket come down, I thought to myself, wow. You know, I felt that release. I felt like those chains coming off because I felt like my, I was bound. I felt like I was like wound tight. And I needed to be unwind. And uh, so I thought, okay, this, you know, these people are giving their lives to the Lord. Maybe I'll just do this too. So I did. I asked Davy Beckett, which is the pastor at the time. And he, uh, he just brought me through the steps, the ABCs, accept, believe, continue to believe, and be determined to carry on uh, with your belief. Uh, I went through all that, but I didn't feel anything. And I just sat there and I listened to them all around me, shuffling and shifting and praying and all that kind of stuff. And I went home kind of disappointed, going, I thought there would be more. You know, and I got to my home, went up into, the, into my room, and I was sitting there looking at all the other stuff I've been using. You know, among, amongst that, there was a whole lot more addictions than just that. And I, I sat there just thinking about the dream, thinking about what I've just done, what I've just seen. And I decided just to sit there for a few seconds and play the, the keyboard that I had in the room. And I tried to, to mimic the songs that I was hearing at church, just that once. 
So I started singing those worship songs. And while I was singing those worship songs as best as I could, I heard an audible voice in the room. Now, when you hear an audible voice, it scares the life out of you. I thought the dream was scary, but when you hear an audible voice, which is outside of yourself, it wasn't what you were thinking. And it's the last word that you feel the Lord would tell you. And he told me the word, word, right? And I was like, what's word? So when I, I looked, um, they'd given me a student Bible that night. So I took that student Bible home. And that on the bottom of that Bible, when I opened it and I looked at First John, you know, the word. But then I looked at the bottom and I saw word equals logos. So whenever I thought about Logos a bit more, I was like, I haven't got a clue what this is about. So I took it to Davy Beckett the next day. I took it to Davy Beckett um, at the Elam Church. I walked into his office during the day to find out if he knew anything about Logos. When I walked into the office, I said, Davy, do you know what Logos is? And he burst out laughing. He started laughing at me. I was like, what, what is it? You know, and he told me that he had a handbook open. It was a yellow book. And it was open at a page that said Logos 2 on the page. Logos 2 is a mission ship, and it goes to lots and lots of countries, 250 ports around the world. I'd only just learned about this ship. I heard this word Logos. So whenever uh, he, told me, well, he told me this, he wrote down the number of that organization, and he wrote down the name John Brown, and he told me, call this guy and tell him that God wants you on the ship. Right? And I was like, it's a boat, it's a ship. This is interesting, Logos. So, um, so I called this guy, John Brown, and I said, God wants me on your ship. <laughs> because my pastor told me, he, want, you know, he said that uh, I was to call you and say, God wants me on your ship. So I said exactly that. And the guy said, okay, on the phone. He says, uh, how long have you been a Christian? I said, oh, about a week. You know, so, and he was saying, <laughs> you know, he, he, he had this disappointment in his, in his language. You know, it was like, oh. Can you imagine if I walked into an Elam pastor and said, I'd like to go on missions after only being a Christian a week? And um, so, the, it was just very interesting. So, I went and met this guy, John Brown. I know it's in the 1990s. He's got this tinted windowed Sierra right outside Lisburn train station. So it's quite suspicious during those days. You know, it just felt weird just sitting in this car. And he asked me those questions again. How long have you been a Christian? Well, about a week. Oh, dear. What was the last book that you read? You know, what studies have you done? None. He was like, oh, okay. It was just this disappointment, negativity. And he says, do you have any idea what the Logos is? And I said, it's a mission ship. And he said, okay. Do you have any idea where it is? And I said, you know, Brazil, somewhere in the... You know, I was naive about missions. He says, no, it's in Belfast Harbor. Don't blow your mind. <laughs> Belfast Harbor, of all the harbors it could have been in, over 250 ports, it was in Belfast. I was like, you got to be kidding me, you know? So he, he was really impressed by that testimony. He, f he brought all the leadership of that entire ship to Strickland's Conference Center in Bangor, and had them question me about that testimony. Where, so God spoke to you audibly. Yeah? And I went, yes. And they go, and you've only been a Christian this long? It's like, yes. And um, so he told me, can I be on the ship in three weeks? They give the clearance, all these guys who questioned me give me the clearance, and they also waived all the finances for me to be on, on that ship. They didn't ask for anything. Um, but I know that somebody in that group put a thousand pounds in to cover my expenses while I was there. And they asked me if I could join the ship in Dublin. So I was like, well, okay, here we go. So I went from being that person in that bedroom to getting ready to board a ship. So it was very interesting. But I also remember Davy Beckett's words telling me, if God tells you to do something, do it. And that's something that I've lived by 
my whole life since then is if God tells you to do something, you do it. Because your boldness and your willingness is a key that opens that door. Your boldness to go. So I ended up on this ship. I was so excited about being on this ship. But I'll tell you one other thing first before I go on to that. That whenever I got on the ship in Dublin, I was looking for directions to the kiosk. And I went in for the first time. I walked into that ship. And this, I asked the first person that I met. I said, can you show me how to get to the reception? And she went, you go that way? Right? That's the Puerto Rican uh, PowerPoint. That's what I call it. <laughs> so this little woman told me where to go. And she pointed me in the direction of the kiosk where I was to sign in in, in this reception, okay? So whenever I went up into the, I went to the kiosk, and you probably understand that the person that I met was Rosa. That was where I learned that they invented the PowerPoint and that uh, they have this, this feistiness about them. So I thought to myself, who she thinks she is? You know? <laughs> it's like, Flip's sick, that's a nice introduction, you know? So I, I'd never met loud people in my life, you know? Not that loud anyway. So I used to watch them night after night in the kiosk. Latinos are loud as heck. You know, they, they just take up space audibly, you know. And I <laughs> I'll be in trouble later, yeah. But yeah, that, that little woman who pointed me in the right direction ended up being my wife later on, you know. But this is just God laying out my destiny from, from the bedroom to this destiny. You know, from that dark place where nobody was really going to reach me. It had to be God. There was nobody else who was going to pull me out of that room, you know. But so I started doing all the things that God had me do. The first thing that ever happened to me in, on the Logos 2 was I was always kind of like this free-spirited person. So I was always moving on, you know, where people told me not to go. So I was always going where I wasn't supposed to go. And there was one place in Estonia where I walked in to a place and this, this bald guy came up to me and I gave him a leaflet. It's like, here you go. We're having an outreach. And you're invited. You know, it's just really like that. And he, said, he spoke to me in English. He says, are you here to translate my dream? I'm like, excuse me? You know, he, he's got earrings, tattoos, bald head, biker jacket. And he's got all these. And then I noticed there was a swastika on his uh, jacket. And I thought, okay, swastika on the jacket, swastika in his ears. And then I started putting two and two together. And I realized I was talking to somebody in a gang. So this guy asks me, uh, he tells me about his dream. He says, I have 12 candles. One candle goes out every night. And I've only got three candles left. <clears throat> so me in my own way, I just said, well, the other candle goes out, you're dead. You know, that's just how plain I was with him. I looked at his face and he went, okay, like that. And I said, you're invited. And I walked away. But what happened later was, I went to the church I was ministering in, and he came through the front door. When he came through the front door, everybody on this side of the church went to this side of the church. And he stood right there. Nobody would go near him, because everybody knew who he was. So he listened to us minister and sing. And then afterwards, he came to our group, and he gave his life to the Lord. He was the gang leader. So that was the first person the Lord ever had me do anything. And that was my first encounter with that. And that was in Estonia. In, uh, that's part of, like, cut off part of Russia. And, uh, you know, God did beautiful things like that, just one after the other. Every time he asked me to do something, I did it. So me and Rosa lived in Northern Ireland for a while. We were married here. And then we moved over to Puerto Rico. And in Puerto Rico, we had a great time for about seven months, but then I ran out of, we were starting to run out of money. We were over there because we felt like the Lord had led us in the direction of America, but we ended up in Puerto Rico instead, which was quite nice. Um, but when we started to run out of money, I had a dream again, and the dream was that the only person that was supporting us financially was going to die. And that was uh, Rose's... Uh, Grandfather, thank you. <laughs> Rose's grandfather, who was a lovely, lovely man, was supporting us. And <clears throat> so what happened next 
was that I decided to go out for a walk. And I went for a walk for miles and miles in Puerto Rico. I was a white guy in the, in the darkest neighborhoods. And the, everybody was black. I was the white guy. So everyone was looking at me coming down the street wondering what this guy doing. You know, so sometimes it's dangerous for a white guy in Puerto Rico because sometimes they took a pot shot at me once. I was walking down the road to the video shop and somebody shot a gun over the top of my head uh, while I was going down there just to unnerve me. They weren't trying to kill me, but they were trying to startle me. And so walking again, I went walking through these neighborhoods. And I was just asking God, what, what are you doing with our lives right now? And I sat down on a bench and I asked the Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? And he, I heard the word again. God seems to speak to me with one word each time. And the word was citizenship. So whenever I saw citizenship, I looked up. and I, I saw citizenship on the side of a building. Now, I was married to Rosa. Rosa's American. So I ended up uh, having a green card. So it turned out, if you have a green card, I could walk into this building that the word with citizenship was on. And this building was a U.S. Army recruiting center. So I was like, Lord, do you want me to join the Army? You, really? And I heard the word citizenship again, and then I heard it again, and then I heard it again. So I walked into that recruiting office, this U.S. Army recruiting office, and I said, can I have a job? I don't know if you know that, but if you're in America, you don't walk into a U.S. Army recruiting center and say, I want a job, because they'll put you on the front line, right? But what happened next was there was all these Puerto Ricans and one Mexican, and Mexicans are quite you know, funny at times, and the, the Mexican guy picks up the phone and goes, God, one of yours has come in. <laughs> he didn't do it with a Northern Ireland accent, by the way, but he said, one of yours has come in. He says he wants to be a chaplain assistant. Can he be a chaplain assistant? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is that right? And then he hung the phone up and said, uh, God said no. You can't be a chaplain assistant. But uh, God said you could be a medic. See those words when he said that? God said that you could be a medic. It just resonated. And I went, okay. So I signed on the line. And they, they give me thousands of dollars. Yeah, thousands. <laughs> Which is really good because I hadn't seen money in a while. And um, so it was great to have money. But they, 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 they sent me, they shipped me out about a week after that. So I ended up on this plane with all these Puerto Ricans. So I was the only white guy in this batch of people going to the United States, which I'd never been to before. I'd only passed through an airport once or twice. And um, here I am, the white dot in the middle of all these people. And when I got to the reception station at the US Army in uh, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, which is in lots of movies, the guys were asking me, well, who's with the, what's the, with the white guy? You know, so all these Puerto Ricans, like Rosa, were all asking, who's the white guy? What's he doing with us? You know, where's he going? Is he an ex-con or something? You know, like, like that. And they asked me a question, so who are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Rodney, I'm from Ireland. You're from Ireland? You're not even American? I says, no, I'm from, I'm from Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland? Well, what are you doing here? I said, well, I married a Puerto Rican. So well, that was a mistake, wasn't it? You know, that's the sort of conversation that was going on. And uh, they said, well, and then they asked me if I was an ex-con. I said, no. He says, so why are you here? I said, well, God told me to join the army. And God told you what? I said, God told me to join the army. I went, okay. He turned around and said, this is a crazy one. So they all thought I was crazy. The sergeants at the reception station thought I was crazy as well. So what happened after that was we started the training and, uh, you know, I'd never been in America before. This was my actual first step in America. So I'm doing this crazy, crazy thing. And, um, you know, start going through the training. The first thing they did was change my name in the training. They changed my name from Private Burton to Private Ireland. You know, in the scripture where it would say, um, you know, I will give you a new name. You know, so I was given a new name. And the name was Ireland, of all things. So it was called Private Ireland. And they kept calling me that the whole way through. When I got to my first station, my first duty post, they uh, called me out in front of 790 men because the captain came out and he said, where's my Irishman? I'm like, 
oh, there's two of us? You know? <laughs> I was like, who's the, who's the other guy? I'd like to meet him. And then it turned out I was the only, the only Irish guy, so, or Northern Irish guy. So he had me run around all the 790 people, right round into the front where the commander was standing. The commander hands me a box, this long box. So I open the box, and there's this flag in three pieces. So he had me screw the flag together and hold the unit banner. So I ended up being the mascot, pretty much, of this unit, and I was carrying the flag. So every run we ever did, I always was at front, and I was always carrying that flag everywhere we went. <clears throat> but you've heard of the, you know, the expression, for such a time as now, yeah? And I was following God. I was just being obedient and doing the things that he asked me to do when he said it. And I just sort of walked blindly into it. So two months after I joined the army, these two planes hit the towers in New York. So 9-11 happened, right? And it sent everything into a really interesting thing for me personally, because here I am, I'm the only person that's not of this nation, you know, from Ireland, you know, and I'm, I'm in this country that's not mine. I'm in this army that's not mine. And the Lord, this starts to unfold, 9-11, the chaos. And I was ab amongst a whole bunch of people from New York in my training. So everybody was grieving in a real deep way because of this deep impact that this terrorist attack had on America. But I was privileged to start praying with them. So I prayed with those guys as this was going on, as this was unfolding. So training resumed after that. And we got until 2000 and, uh, 2003, and it was just coming up to March. I was given the orders. Uh, I got a phone call one day. I was just chilling out with Rosa and my firstborn, Kayla. And we got a phone call, and I was told I have, I have um, 12 hours to be at the airfield. What, I've been, what had happened is, is I got selected for a, a specialized task force. It was like a task force put together to pretty much invade Baghdad. So it's not like a special ops or anything like that. It was a just a task force put together of all these different units, and they're going to put all these medics in all these different places, and they were going to be on the tip of that spear that went into Baghdad. So I ended up right there on the tip of that spear in 2003, March 23rd, whenever we went across the berm into Iraq. And uh, so life is getting interesting. As a medic, I saw some crazy things, things that your eyes are just not meant to see. And uh, it sort of splits your soul into whenever it first happens. So uh, I know what it feels like whenever you see the death of a child or whether you see the death of a woman or a man or people hanging from windows or just pieces, you know, a whole person wasted, a life wasted on the desert floor. If I take you back to my dream, I was on the desert floor and I saw all these bodies scattered, right? When I was standing just before I went into combat, I saw this triangular shape of attack helicopters go over my head. They weren't just regular helicopters, they were marine helicopters. So they're really heavy diesel sound in their engines. So it wasn't like a tick 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 it was a like locusts went over my head in a triangular shape up and over a mountain and into Baghdad and they started blowing the heck out of everything. So all of this is unfolding and I'm just praying. I'm embedded, you know, in this unit and I'm just praying, the, first of all, for my own life. I was afraid at first. Everybody is afraid at first. And after a while, you'll find out what you're really made of. And, but I started clinging on to scripture and I remembered God's promises. Um, so I want to draw you back to something. Um, back, way back to the beginning, when I first became a Christian. I was given all these scriptures whenever I became a Christian. I was given Deuteronomy 20. I was given Isaiah 43. I was given Isaiah 45 in chapters. And the things I remember most is 
this little old man that walked up to me and gave me the, the scripture for Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy 20 says, an officer will come out in front of you and tell you that you're going to war and you are surely going to war, right? And this old man had given me this word and I actually thought spiritual, a spiritual war was coming. I never for a minute thought it would be physical. But whenever the officer walked out in front of us before we went into Iraq, he got up on the podium and he said, today you're going to war. You are surely going to war. Right? It sent chills through my body. Just that, just those words. And I remembered that the Lord had given me that scripture. But after I'd finished this, uh, all this combat, I was traumatized heavily. I was traumatized beyond belief, but I didn't know it until later on. Whenever, you know, Rosa started to notice all the changes that were happening week after week after week. I was getting bad. I was like going back into a bad place. Um, you know, I was waking up. I, was, I had to sleep in the garden. I had to sleep outside. I had to get away from the people that were standing around my bed while I was trying to sleep. You know, all these people who were dead, who had seen dead, were all living and standing around my bed. So I had all these nightmares. And sometimes I woke up and it felt like they were actually there. You know, and that there was one night they actually talked to me. And they said, why? You know? And th this is the sort of stuff that happens to people with trauma. And so I was living with that for quite some time. Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 45, it says, you will go through the waters. You see the song that we were singing? That's the song I wrote while I was there. You will go through the waters. You will go through the rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. Right? You will go through the fire. You will go through combat. Most nights I saw stuff burning and blowing up. And just in the distance, you know, whole petrol stations blowing up. And that's quite an explosion. So fire at night. It goes on to say that, don't be afraid. I will take you by the hand and I will lead you through this. It also says that you will lead out people who have eyes but cannot see. Eye injuries. You will lead out people who have ears but can't hear. Perforated eardrums from hand grenades or bomb explosions. It goes on to say that you will see gates of bronze broke through. All the gates were bronze. You will see bars of iron cut through. Whenever they brought down the statue of Saddam Hussein, actually every statue that they had had like two metal bars in it and they had to be cut through to bring them down, right? And <clears throat> said, you will see a king stripped of his armor. Saddam Hussein's armored unit was stripped in 16 minutes, was, that was their special forces tank regiment, it took 16 minutes for the Americans to completely dispose of them. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that living word? The word is alive. You know, it speaks to people way back in the past and it speaks to us now. And it lives. And this is just the Lord. He's, he's the one that lives. He's the, the one that's in me. He's the one that's in these scriptures. So, Isaiah 45, it goes on to say that you will be given a rank of honor. I was given the, the Mr. Congeniality Award at the, <laughs> in the unit. So, I was the person, I was the oldest guy, believe it or not. I was 26, and everyone else was like a teenager, like 18, 19. So I was like the older brother, the older guy, and um, through basic training and stuff like that. So a rank of honor. You will see treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places. Whenever we stormed Saddam Hussein's area as compounds, there was a lot of stuff recovered. Some stuff that would just be shocking. So it's a great thing that he was taken away uh, out of power because of the things that he was doing. And you wouldn't believe, and I, I don't want to start like telling you everything he was doing, but he was a bad man. And um, so we uncovered the treasures of darkness, which is stored in secret places. Yeah, and it goes on. That, that's, that's the Lord. He had already destined this for me back when I became a Christian. The scripture was with me 
since the day I got saved. And I didn't realize it until later. When I looked back, I realized, oh my goodness, this was planned out. Hope I'm not going on too much. <laughs> I'm not watching my time. But um, what happened next was, is that I was traumatized for quite some time. And God brought me out of that trauma one day whenever I heard him tell me, go to Spain. I hadn't heard him for a while. And I'd struggled through this PTSD for quite some time. But I heard him tell me, go to Spain. I was like, okay, I'll go to Spain. I said, Lord, I have no money. So I looked up the flights. All the flights were $711. Um, I'm like, $711, that's quite steep. And then, um, but the thing is, every ticket was $711 the whole way down the page. So I asked the Lord, okay, I'll go if you give me $711. So I woke up the next morning, went out. The wee arrow was up on my mailbox. So I went to my mailbox and I put the arrow down, opened it, and there's an envelope inside with Spain written on it. So how much do you think was in the envelope? $711. Right? So I'm like, I guess God must really want me to go. So I went back into the house. I looked up the tickets, and I couldn't find any tickets for $711. Right? So I thought, what's, something's missing. So I plotted a different course. I said... Georgia, United States, Northern Ireland to Spain. As soon as I did that, the price came back to $711. So I went back to Northern Ireland. While I was in Northern Ireland, I ended up praying for a lady who had a tumor. She was completely healed from the tumor. She jumped up out of her seat and started dancing around, and I could feel the heat off the top of her head. And I felt like you know, it was just boiling hot where the tumor was, and the, the tumor's gone. You know, later on down the road, that lady met me in Tesco's in Bangor, and she said, it's you. You're the guy that prayed over me, and you're the guy, you know, I got healed like that. And she shouted it in Tesco's, and then another woman came up and says, this guy prayed for me too. You know, and then it, this thing happened in Tesco's, but I won't go into that. It's kind of, that's another thing where the, the person on the cashier started crying, and we ended up ministering to the girl who was crying. But, um, but God opens up those doors, and it's really sweet, and it's really wonderful and beautiful. And I've forgotten where I was. Spain. Thanks, bud. Uh, Spain. So I went to Spain. While I was in Spain, I started wandering around. But what happened next was whenever I went into the first hotel, I was with a pastor, Emilio uh, Seville, who was a student at Elam, Bangor Elam. And he was there. He had invited me out there. So that's my contact in Spain. He invited me to his area because I knew he heard I was coming to Spain. Whenever we both got to the hotel, this guy walks out to me called George. He goes, hi, I'm George. The devil has sent me to be at this hotel. I'm like, okay, my pastor's white. And he's like, and uh, I say, well, hi, I'm Rodney, and God has sent me from America to be at this hotel. <laughs> so this guy follows me about everywhere as I walk about. And uh, I went to these meetings. I ended up meeting with uh, Cindy Jacobs in a small gathering of just a few people just around the corner from this hotel. I don't know if you know Cindy Jacobs, but she's a bit of a, uh, she gives words and prophesies over people uh, in the United States. And uh, so I'm mixing with these people. I still don't quite know what God wants me to do. So I went to the edge of a cliff in Benidorm. And I worshipped on that cliff. When I worshipped on that cliff, I got a vision. And the vision was of all these refugees coming across the oceans. And there was thousands upon thousands upon thousands of refugees. And I saw all these dominoes going down across the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. And I saw it doof, 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 towards Israel until it landed in Egypt and just in Egypt. So I'm looking out there, you know, I've got this impression of all these refugees, and thousands upon thousands. I saw children dying in the sea. And uh, so I told my pastor that, or the pastor I was with, sorry. And he, 
he just told me there's, there's already a refugee issue. You know, this is nothing new. And I said, but I mean, this is really big. I mean, you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of refugees. So you know what happened next, right? That was 2008. The refugee crisis didn't happen until 2015. I've been telling people about this crisis up until that point. And uh, so what ha that, that's where everything started getting more for me was whenever the refugee crisis happened because I got invited right into the middle of that refugee crisis to minister to the Syrians and just to, uh, to pray over them and bless them and to receive people coming in. You know, the Syrians were giving, them, giving their lives to the Lord, left, right, and center. And uh, so I started meeting with people. I have a lot of stories and a lot of testimonies. So uh, I know I probably won't be able to tell you everything tonight, but there's so much more. Uh, one I want to tell you is about how I got into the middle of the refugee crisis. And that was the, uh, the surfer dude. Right, I'm at a church in Portadown, and the surfer, well, he sounds like a surfer dude, like, hey man, like that. He looks like Elvis, right? So he's up, he's, he looks at me and he goes, the boat is going to get your attention, man. You've got to catch the next wave. Catch the next wave, man, like that. And I was like freaking out. <laughs> But I thought, okay, I'll take that in. So two days later, I get a phone call from YWAM asking me, will I come lead worship? We're going to have two weeks of worship, 24-7. We need a 24-7 worshiper. So I said, okay. And then they wrote back to me and said, do you mind where you worship? I was like, what do you mean? They said, well, it's on a boat. The boat will get your attention. And I went, okay, I'll, I'll think about it. He says, I'll send you a picture of it, is what they said. So they sent me a picture of the ship. I looked at it and thought, that's a really tiny boat. It only holds 21 people. And I thought, oh, no, I don't think I could do this again. But I blew the picture up, and I looked at the name of the boat. So what do you think the name of the boat was? Next wave. So... The boat's going to get your attention, man. Catch the next wave. <laughs> so, like, oh, oh, well, okay, here we go again. So, so I caught the next wave. It's a YWAM mission ship. And it was, uh, I went there, and I realized, and when I got there, we were actually part of a big group deciding the fate of this ministry. Where the ship's going to be decommissioned or commissioned where they're going to be taken away and not used. But what happened was, because of the worship, we ended up, they ended up recommissioning those ships back into service for that refugee crisis. I also had dreams of babies being set on beaches. They were brought in by the waves and set down on a pebble beach. There was a pebble beach, and these were all individual children, so I thought to myself, unaccompanied minors, that ship ended up taking care of the unaccompanied minors part of the beach in Lesvos. You know, that was the networking. This is God bringing this about. He had them there, and you know why? To stop those children from falling into human trafficking. Right? God just puts the pieces together. He brings people from everywhere. It's not just me. I'm just a vessel that the Lord uses. And I'm just obedient to what he asks me to do. So I've been doing lots of things. And I know you've heard lots of testimonies, but it's all, the, it's all these little things that God does, which all has purpose. And I just go and do. That's why I just recently spoke to thousands in Norway. You know, that door opened up crazy because God told me to go stand, worship in the Arctic Circle in Norway. It opened up where I was able to speak to all the leaders of Norway just from a simple go and do, right? I went north and south and east and west in Norway. I preached in coffee, coffee shops, and Les was with me on one of those trips. We went to art galleries, worshipped in art galleries and coffee shops. 
And the experiences are endless. There's just something else to do, something else to do, something else to do. And I've met so many people across the world that do the same thing. All because of those wee things. And that's, that's how I walked out trauma, by the way. Trauma was walked out because God gave me something to do. And I walked it out. I know you've heard me say that before. Uh, walking it out with him. Roll up your mat and walk. Amen. Right? I was sick. I was traumatized. Roll up your mat and walk it out. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Walking it out. And I don't want to stop walking it out. I want to keep walking it. And I don't want to stop. And I think he, d he can do this with all of us. You know, it's not just me. I'm just flesh and bones. I'm just, I'm just Rodney, but God is God, you know. And he meets people where they're at. So even if you're hiding in the corner of the room and nobody can see you, he can see you. He knows what's been said in that room. He knows what's been said on that street where we can't see it. So if he tells you to go do something, do it. I want to share somebody else's testimony just for one second. I'm going to end with that because I know I've been talking for a bit. And I know I could go on for the rest of the night. And I'm sure you don't want that. But, um, <laughs> but there was this testimony that was given to me by a friend who knows uh, Robbie Daw Dawkins. And uh, he's an evangelist uh, from the United States who has ministered to the Taliban and has ministered to the King's uh, gangs of L.A. and stuff like that. And um, he, he spoke about this testimony of a girl who was just walking down the road. She was just a teenager, you know, just as young as Anya there. And um, so she's walking merrily down the street, and God says, go into that store and stand on your head. <laughs> Would you do it? Yeah? Go into that store and stand on your head. So she was nervous about this, but she kept hearing it. So she decided, okay, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to stand on my head. So she went into the shop and stood on her head. And when she stood on her head, a guy burst out crying. He was talking to another guy, and that guy was trying to tell him about Jesus. And he had said to this guy, I will believe in Jesus the minute somebody walks through that front door and stands on their head. <laughs> right? An act of obedience a soul saved. That's what it's all about. You know, I'm, I'm, nobody, I'm nobody special, but God in me makes everything special. I'll wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs>